Some of my favorite topics in computer science are artificial intelligence, quantum, and cryptography. These are my obsessions. I, and if they're yours, if these are topics that interest you, you definitely want to stick around. I've got a really interesting guest today. We're going to talk about sort of how these things come together in a really unique way uh, around a, a, a company a lot of you may have heard of called Sandbox AQ. So I hope you stick around. You're going to enjoy our discussion today. Hi, this is Ed Amoroso from Tag Cyber. I want to welcome you to our discussion. We've got a really interesting guest, um, my friend Graham Steele, who is um, the head of product for the Quantum Security Group over at Sandbox AQ. We're going to ask him about crypto and quantum. He's an expert. I think you're going to enjoy it. So, hey, Graham, welcome to our discussion today. Hey, Ed. It's great to be here. Thanks a lot. It's wonderful to see you. So uh, too bad we're not together in New York. Well, maybe next time we can do this face-to-face, uh, -face. but virtual works, at least we get a chance to chat. So before we get into our discussion, why don't you give us a real quick summary of the company? Uh, a lot of people are hearing uh, about the about your very fine uh, company. So give, give them an elevator speech on what you guys do. Sure. So Sandbox AQ uh, is a company that was originally incubated inside Google X. It's at the nexus between AI and quantum. And so we're looking at this new world where we have quantum enabled computing technologies. We also have AI to support that. And these two things are very synergistic, as you know, right? So it's using AI that we're going to be able to harness the power of quantum computing. And quantum computing is actually going to give us more power in our AI as well. One really interesting consequence of practical quantum computers of a, a realistic scale and doing error correcting, as you know, is a, a quite serious consequence for cybersecurity, which is that all of the major systems that we use today for public key cryptography, so that's everything from digital signature to communication or so securing data over the network, they're actually going to be broken by these quantum computers. And so we're in a race against time to update our cryptography systems to be ready for that. And so a big part of the, the quantum security group, as we call it, inside Sandbox AQ is about that problem, about trying to uh, create tools that allow our customers to get visibility on where they're using encryption and authentication and all of these vital cryptographic technologies, figure out where they need to fix them, get them up to date, and how they're going to migrate them to what we call post-quantum cryptography. So cryptography that is going to resist the algorithms that will be possible and efficient on these new uh, quantum computers. So yeah, that's really what we're doing in a nutshell inside quantum security group of Sandbox AQ. It's such a wonderful combination of technologies. I know my, my graduate students at NYU, this is their favorite topics, like the idea of combining crypto and AI and quantum <laughs> died and went to heaven. Uh, type work. So it's going to be fun hearing about what you're doing. Let's see, uh, for you personally, how did you get into all of this? You, uh, did you sort of start with uh, cryptography as a base in, in your own career as you as you got into this? How, well, tell us a little bit about your journey. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so so I'm a mathematician uh, by original training. So my, my university degree is in mathematics, but I've always been obsessed with codes and encrypting data and keeping things secret. So when I was a kid, I used to encrypt my diary so that my older brother couldn't read it using a really simple code. But my mother, who was a computer programmer in the 1970s, she actually worked for, for IBM. She showed me how with our home computer, you could break my code. So doing a frequency analysis. So that's where we figure out which substitutions have been used the most right. often. So that's probably the E in your alphabet and then so on. And we can yeah. figure out the, the code. And from that point onwards, I knew that I really wanted to work in what I didn't even know the name of, but was the field of cryptography. So getting together mathematics and secret codes, essentially. So I did my mathematical training. I worked as a researcher after my PhD for 10 years, running a research group, supervising PhDs. Uh, but at a certain point, I became kind of frustrated that we were making all these great advances in the laboratory. But the state of the use of cryptography in the real world was actually pretty poor. So think about the number of times you read, OK, there's been a data breach and you know, 40,000 records of, of social security numbers have been lost. Well, you must always ask yourself the question, why wasn't that data encrypted? Right. We shouldn't be keeping all that data around in the clear. And the reality is that deploying cryptography at scale in a large organization is way too hard. That's why it's not being done all the time. We're really behind in terms of how we manage the really important technologies of cryptography. 
compared to where we are, let's say, with other cybersecurity technologies like um, like firewalls. So let's say firewalls. There's no way in a big organization you would just let every project group deploy their own firewalls, set them up, you know, run them, do what they need to. You would have some kind of central control, right? And you would want visibility on how everything was set up and a possibility of reacting and changing the rules to be protected if there were new threats or, or new compromises that were going on. So the vision of the quantum security group in Sandbox AQ is, is to do that for uh, cryptography. Right? So what I, I got into this because I started a company out of my research uh, group. Uh, the company was called CryptoSense. Uh, and we were essentially going after the same problem, although at the time, the, the awareness of the quantum uh, threat wasn't really there. We were really looking to solve immediate problems that enterprises were having around data leaking, um, data that hadn't been encrypted that should have been encrypted. So we started working on this problem of how do we make tools that help large organizations find their cryptography? Like, where is it? Is it in the application? Is it in the infrastructure? Is it in a third party tool? Uh, how can I find things that are wrong and start to fix them? So we worked that out. We were working on this uh, from 2013 when the company was founded. We started picking up some really big kind of lighthouse customers in US big four banks, also in big credit card companies and so on really starting to, to get some traction. And we were looking at getting uh, more investment and growing the company. But then there was this beautiful meeting where we kind of ran into to Sandbox AQ, thanks to some kind of mutual contacts. So in Sandbox AQ, they realized that before we can start fixing cryptography for this post-quantum age, so getting these new algorithms in there that are gonna resist the quantum computers, we need to find what we actually have now, right? So we need to find a way to make these upgrades without breaking anything. Can't take operational risks of you know, encrypting data in a way that we can't decrypt it in the other part of the company or whatever it is. So for that, we really need tools for discovery and analysis of cryptography to complement these new algorithms that we're going to deploy. So there's this really nice meeting between Sandbox and CryptoSense. That's how I find myself uh, having started as a mathematician and a researcher on this path, going all the way into being the head of product now for the quantum security group here in Sandbox. I think our industry's had this recurrent theme of trying to figure out how to combine the beauty of cryptography with practical work. I remember Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography, when that came out, I thought, okay, finally something a programmer can sort of understand. I think that got us up a little bit, but I also noticed the same thing, that you, you it, it, over time, perhaps some of that enthusiasm atrophied, and you started to see some very bad use of cryptography. But would you say that the big issue, like in terms of cryptographic life cycle, is that most of the crypto is kind of hidden in other things? Is that one of the problems like third party and open source? You just because I know in my own experience, when there's like a, a, a crypto weakness, the first question is, OK, do we have that problem. And then everybody looks around each other because I, I, I have no idea. And then, and then is that sort of like what is that a big piece of the problem? Just having no clue where these utilities are, are being used? Yeah, I think it's yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a recurrent theme across all kinds of cybersecurity is looking for visibility, right? Observability of our systems that we've built these really complex systems so that we know how to react when there's a cyber threat. And we wouldn't accept this situation in, in other places, right? The, the idea that if there was a buggy version of a library, we, we should know we've got a buggy version of a library somewhere. But when somebody says, for example, uh, triple dares encryption, we need to get rid of that. Well, where is it? Where are we using that? It's very, very difficult to know that because it could be inside a library. It could be a library that we don't know whether we use it or not. It might be in someone else's code, my code, part of the framework of the application. Uh, it's really tough to get that. So yeah, absolutely. Getting that visibility, that observability on cryptography is a, is a huge part of the battle. Once we have that, then we can start to take actions. But, uh, but where we're starting from is most large orgs don't have that deep visibility at the moment. How, how do you guys do that? Is there a tentacle sort of piece to this where you're reaching out and then pulling the telemetry? Is it telemetry? Is it static analysis? What are, what are the techniques you use to, to find this uh, cryptography? Yeah, so we did use a whole bunch of different techniques uh, and they all feed into a central uh, product, which was the CryptoSense product, now the CryptoSense module of Sandbox and Q. So those things come from file system scanning, from static scanning of code, from tracing applications as they run. So when they call their cryptographic library, we actually trace those calls and feed that information in. We also do network detection. So we break down uh, exchanges we see in the network of cryptographic protocols to pull that in. So we're really looking for all kinds of data sources to, to make what we call a three-dimensional inventory of the cryptography. 
So we want to be able to cross-reference, right? So remember I was talking about, we want to be able to make changes to cryptography without operational risk. We don't want to be able to you know, upgrade something here, but break something here at the same time. So we want to be able to say, okay, I saw a key being used. It's stored in this file here, and it's called from this line of the application. And that way I can make the upgrade without breaking stuff. And that's really, really important. So let's talk about part B now. So first part A is finding, um, building a, as part of the life cycle, building an inventory and understanding through visibility. Once that's done, tell us a little bit about these weaknesses. Like um, I, some people might be familiar with Shor's algorithm and, and some other things that are dictating that uh, maybe we better take action. Give us a little uh, 101 on the quantum threat. And then we can talk about what we do about, but start with what you think is the problem and, and how real uh, someone should should view this problem as being. Yeah, right. So, so one of the algorithms that we know about that will definitely be able to execute uh, very efficiently on a large size uh, quantum computer is Shor's algorithm, which is able to essentially factor the product of uh, two large prime numbers, which is the fundamentally uh, difficult problem that is at the base of a huge amount of the cryptography that we use, in particular the RSA crypto system, but also some of the elliptic curve stuff that we use. So if we have a computer that can do that, then we're in a lot of uh, trouble. So what can we do? Why, why is that important now? Well, even if this Actually, large computer- on that, A lot of trouble, that's the store the store now, decrypt later thing. Maybe you could share what that, because a lot of trouble is, might be trouble now. Right? So, yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we can't afford to wait till this comes along before we start fixing things, because uh, typically when we ship large amounts of sensitive data around on the internet, we first do a asymmetric based uh, exchange. So to establish the key that we're gonna to use to encrypt that data, and then we go ahead and encrypt the data. And so an adversary could be recording those exchanges that set up the key right now, and just keeping them all on file, and also keeping the encrypted data that they saw go through uh, the network. And then when this large computer comes along, they can just go back to that exchange, figure out the key and decrypt all that data. Right. So anything that we're transferring between data centers right now uh, could be vulnerable to that kind of store now. To and a subset of activity today will be relevant in the future. Some may not be, but enough could be that like a bank probably ought not to just pass this off as like a, you know, the quantum thing is you know, four or five. I think NIST says seven to 10 years. I think that's on the, the high end personally, but. So it, this is not the future threat. This could be a threat to activity going on today. Do I, ha do I have that right? I want to make sure people watching are not getting the impression that this is some future problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, and, and you're right. We, you don't want to scaremonger on this thing. Some things that a, a bank does today, it doesn't matter if they become known tomorrow. Like, you know, what I traded today, it's confidential intraday, but then I have to publish it for regulation the next That's day. Right. Anyway, so, so, so we don't need to worry about that too much. But some data is really long-term important, right? So the medical records of somebody now who's 18, they're still going to be around, hopefully, when they're 50 years old. We don't want that data to, to be leaked. So you can talk about things like data half-life, like you know, when is that data still very sensitive? Uh, at what point is it in the future that they need yeah. to, to figure that out? There's also another angle to this in terms of the threat in the future, and that's to do with uh, updates. So pretty much every system we have now takes code updates, right? Uh, and those code updates are signed. Of course, we do code signing. We don't just allow any old code to be downloaded and, and run as an update. So though that signature, that's also done with public key cryptography, which in the future will be uh, quantum vulnerable. Oh, that's fine. So we could update it in the future. The problem is if we're deploying very long lived embedded devices, for example, today, so let's say a, a car uh, that's a luxury car. So we're expecting a good 20, 30 year lifespan. Uh, it makes sense to design that car today in such a way that it can support post quantum cryptography, even if that's a go to the shop upgrade in the future to make sure that we can secure those updates as the those, uh, quantum computers become near on the horizon. Because otherwise you've got a, another whole nasty attack where as soon as that computer uh, becomes available, I can take over the code of all of the cars in your fleet. So there, there's basically these two angles that people are already thinking about now. One is the store now decrypt data and the other is long limbed embedded devices yeah. that need code updates. That makes sense. Now you guys are in the post quantum cryptography business. Tell us a little bit about, so it's kind of a nice progression. Like we're gonna find your stuff, we give you some feel for what the threats are. And now, you know, at Sandbox, you guys are good at providing some solutions. Maybe a couple words on what the solutions are and how post-quantum cryptography works. Like, what are the strategies there? 
Right. So, so NIST for some time has been running a standardization process for these candidate algorithms to be uh, the replacements for asymmetric cryptography that resist uh, quantum. At Sandbox, we're a little bit agnostic about you know, when you might want to make that change or whether you're going to want to use this algorithm or that algorithm out of the standard. Maybe in the future, you're going to want to use some kind of quantum enabled communication like quantum key distribution. It's not really kind of ready for prime time right now, but you know, it could be in the, in the future. So what we propose is what's called crypto agility. So a way to abstract out the layer in your system where you do the cryptography in such a way that you have telemetry on it, you can see it, you can change it uh, safely in the future as and when you need to do. So our idea is really you only want to make this change once, right? You don't want to update all of your systems to one of the NIST algorithms. And then maybe in five, 10 years, we find actually that algorithm has been broken. You can have to make all the updates again. We really want to make cryptography this kind of first class cybersecurity object, just like things like firewalls, like I mentioned earlier, that you have continuous visibility on and the control plane where you can change it. So that's really what the quantum uh, security groups work is inside uh, Sandbox AQ is producing that crypto agile layer that in the future will be the way that we do cryptography everywhere. Well, hopefully you and I have been sufficiently interesting that some people watching will say, wow, I want to I want to learn more. <laughs> is, is your website the best place? Like if somebody says, hey, I really would like to get more uh, info, what, what should they be reading or doing or, or following? Yeah, absolutely. They should go to the, the Sandbox AQ website as a starting point. Uh, there's also some interesting little blogs there and technical mm -hmm. stuff as well. Uh, the sort of Crypto Cafe uh, blog that we run out of the corner of security group where you can really get into the nitty gritty details if you want to. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really good place to start to find out. more. I, I wrote something for you guys. I bet it's probably there, too. I'm, I'm super interested in what you guys are doing. I think this is um, I, I it's it's hard not to enjoy it just uh, intellectually it's so interesting but i think it's a, a good example of a practical problem that we can maybe do with the ultimate shift left like really take the time now to fix a future problem when was the last time the industry did that graham in cyber we always wait for these big problems to happen and then we fix them after I, may, maybe we can actually do this right i, I hope so yeah, well, I think I in a lot of organizations, we see that the, it's almost an excuse, right? The fact that we need to fix cryptography anyway for the quantum thread, it's like, well, why don't we actually do it properly this time and actually get that visibility and the ability to manage it? And we're well, going to get yeah. benefits from that straight away, even way, way before quantum computers come up. Yeah, we preach cryptographic lifecycle management and crypto agility at Tag Cyber. That's a big, big topic. So that's our, um, you know, take vitamins and exercise kind of guidance mm -hmm. to uh, enterprise teams. But Graham, it's wonderful that you had some time today to share with us. I, I appreciate um, all the learning. Keep up the good work there. It looks like a very fun place to work. And uh, I hope your team uh, keeps making progress as you have. Thanks, Ed. This has been a lot of fun. Let's do it in New York next time. You bet. Nice to see you. For everyone else watching, we'll see you next time.